everybody in attendance. Welcome to Delivering Film Quality Visual Effects on Episodic Timelines. And this is hosted here by Foundry at Spark FX 2021. So today you're going to get the chance to get some firsthand insight on episodic production for all of these shows that we love to binge watch. We're going to get these insights from some incredibly talented people. And we're going to have a chance for Q&A from those in the audience. So just a note on the Q&A portion in the chat box below in Zoom, there is a, an another box, which is Q&A. So please put your questions uh, inside of there or they might get lost in the chat. We also have a representative from Foundry in the chat. You'll notice the Foundry logo uh, that will be uh, interactive throughout the session uh, as well. So I am your moderator today. My name is Terry Ryasat. I'm the head of creative services uh, for the Americas at Foundry. And we are joined today by these four fine gentlemen. We have projects ranging from WandaVision to Umbrella Academy to The Hands Made Tale to The Boys Love craft country vikings and the list goes on and on huge list and let's go ahead and start the introduction so first up we have brandon belvins he's compositing supervisor at rodeo fx so welcome brandon next up we have eric dorian who is head of compositing at spin vfx welcome next Next, we have Yash Gouda. He is head of compositing at Monsters, Aliens, Robots, and Zombies, or Mars. So welcome, Yash. And next up, we have Joe Rauch, and he is the senior compositor at Take 5 Productions. And, you know, fun fact about Joe, 90% of his body is now made up of nuke nodes. He's been doing this for a while. <laughs> Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to get started with some questions and Brendan, I'm going to ask you first. So we know that all throughout the past year, a lot has changed on the way we work and your workflow and pipeline has changed to support remote collaboration. So maybe, uh, if you want to just let us know how, uh, Rodeo has been adapting to that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having me out, Terry. Um, yeah, obviously, it was a, you know, it was a big change for all of us, I think, uh, moving into uh, our, our new COVID, COVID world and, and the logistics of how to get, uh, you know, our team, our team online and remotely connected. So we were actually fortunate enough that we had, uh, we already had a few remote artists, uh, not remote, but we we're kind of testing out some, uh, you know, work or from home situations for, you know, either supervisors or people if they were sick. So we had, uh, we already on a system of using HPRGS uh, and a, a VPN uh, connection to be able to remote log into our workstations at work. Nice. Um, so that was kind of the path that we, uh, we chose at Rodeo went down um, and really kind of testing out, you know, how, how many clients we could have on the, the VPN, you know, system and how, how that was going to work with, uh, you know, supporting that with our bandwidth. So within a week or so we were up and running uh, with that solution, which was, which was, which was really a pretty awesome turnaround for, you know, our, our, our team to get everybody up and running. And then I think the hardest part was just distributing, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, monitors or whatever they needed, wake up mm -hmm. tablets, um, you know, getting to everybody's house and so forth. Uh, so were you able to support, I mean, you have clients wanting to get in there. You have all your artists wanting to get in there. Were you able to support this? Were there darker days than other days or everything went more or less uh, smooth? It was, it was a little bit, you know, tricky. I think that, you know, that first week of getting everybody set up and kind of we went slowly in, in groups of, of people that were, you know, able to, to come online and, and, and um, you know, get onto the VPN network. And, and so slowly started to test that connection and it, you know, we found out it was quite stable, you know, it really depended on, you know, we needed to have, uh, you know, people from working from home with a faster connection, obviously, to be able to, um, you know, to, to have to be able to have real time playback. And there's still some hiccups with that. And then, you know, the connection can, can lag at times, but for the most part, it's really quite stable, you know, and we also have the ability to kind of, um, you know, throttle up and down the quality, just to get playback. So we can still have the ability to you know, see things at, you know, full resolution, which is, which is, which is quite amazing. So very convenient that you guys already had a structure in place uh, leading up to everyone having to work from home. But did it uh, sort of evolve beyond that or you're okay uh, right out of the gate? So in other words, from uh, March last year up to the end of uh, the year, did you, was there any adjustments made to, especially the pipeline structure and, and making sure that one department is talking to the next in a nice way? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
you know, it's definitely involved in the way that we're working with each other um, and how that, you know, I think that was, a, you know, for everybody just being being remote and, you know, how do we conduct dailies? Um, how do we look at each other's shots and how do we, uh, you know, how do we have conduct the meetings, which, you know, we are all, I think we're all used to, um, you know, being together in the office and, and a lot of those changes. So um, certainly uh, workflows have adjusted in that regard and, you know, just, just how do we conduct dailies again and not having, um, you know, um, lag and being able to see, uh, you know, your images smoothly. And I think that's still a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. uh, just getting that real time playback. And I think even with us, so with RGS, we do have the ability to, you know, securely log into, uh, you know, the, the presenter's machine and see that directly, which is, which is helpful for, for small dailies and so forth. That's great. I'm glad it's working for you. And Joe, how is the things over at Take Five? So it, we had nothing in place. We were <laughs> we were like the exact opposite. We so Take Five is a Take Five is a production company. Like we, it's the company that actually produces a lot of the shows. Like Vikings is probably the 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 show that we're mo most well known for. But also like Handmaid's Tale, and uh, and so. I, I'm part of like the in-house VFX team. And so as part of the in-house team, we don't have like the big infrastructure. Like literally it's just a few people with, you know, Nuke and, and uh, you know, we bang out shots that way. So we had nothing in place at all. And, you know, you could sort of see like the virus was spreading, virus was spreading, like we were all talking about it. We're like, what, you know, what are we gonna do? And then it was like this one weekend where, you know, like it was like one week where, you know, that, that one week where everything kind of shut down and people were like, oh, this is like a really big thing. And uh, our head of IT, Cam, he, within the weekend, he had us set up using uh, a system called Parsec, which I don't know if you've heard of it or not. I think it's actually like meant for gaming. Like, I think it's meant for like, you can play games with other people, like, uh, you know, like, you, but you can play multiplayer games with other people. And within the weekend, we were all set up and everyone was working from home. It was like, we left on the Friday, kind of not sure what was going on. And then Monday morning, he was like calling us on the phone. Oh yeah, go to your computer, hook this up. And then it was like, we were up and running and I was like, you know, using my system that was at the studio. So it's incredible. The IT departments are, are, are huge yeah. heroes. Unbelievable. This Unbelievable. I, I had never even love. heard of this service before. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he, he had us up and running with it. So it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Um, so lots of credit to him because without that, we would have been kind of screwed. And then right now we're just using, you know, Slack and teams and, uh, and the phone <laughs> a lot to uh, communicate with everybody. So we got like a Slack phone. Channel. That's great. That's great news. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. It's like real time communication. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, like sometimes we'll just call people if, uh, if we need to, to, you know, hash something out. Uh, a lot of jokes go back and forth on Slack and, uh, and yeah. And then teams, sometimes we use teams like Microsoft teams for kind of group calls. Uh, so it's a real mishmash of different things, but uh, it's amazing. I'm amazed with how well that Parsec um, service was working. So yeah, uh, it's really good. I know Parsec as a unit of speed from Star Wars, but I haven't heard it yeah. uh, outside. Of <laughs> yeah, that. look up, look up, uh, go to like uh, if you look up like Parsec Gaming, uh, but it, it has a whole bunch of other like non gaming. It, it's basically you can just you know go into a, another machine like just uh, very easily. That's what the service is. Um, so it's working. It's worked out for us amazingly well. Like I'm, I'm in. I was in shock that within the weekend we were up and running like that. That's great. I mean, this industry really has strived throughout this and found ways and found solutions, which is incredible. Uh, how about you, Yash? Uh, so basically, we modified our pipeline and our internal tools uh, to prioritize the security, and uh, we are using tools like Remote Desktop and DGX to remotely log into our server at the studio with the combination of VPN, of course. And uh, obviously we do not send any files over to the artists and vice versa. And uh, the tool is just to stream monitor from, from the office to uh, you know their home computer. To the home computer. Safe. So we also switched artist exposure from uh, studio-wide uh, access to just show specific access. So if uh, artists are working on specific shows, they just get to access only uh, show specific uh, elements or plates or any details they need. That makes sense. And, yeah. uh, 
uh, yeah, also we do show specific NDAs and uh, yeah, and uh, we have included several PPN specified guidelines to artists for uh, who are remoting from home, which is so that you know they know what they're doing, so it's all secure. And in terms of like uh, communication wise, we use Slack. Uh, uh, the reason is it lets us uh, basically draw on screen, and we are doing dailies on. Uh, uh, pretty much for the entire day and uh, uh, and uh, so since everything is digital it also sort of opens up an idea that we can record the screen and uh, uh, share it with artists so that they can refer whenever it's needed and uh, and uh, so just like uh, working at the office vfx soups uh, and uh, department soups and uh, coordinators we just work together and review the shots uh, and uh, uh, if uh, I know if we have any notes, we just uh, our coordinators feed those things into Shotgun, and uh, uh, that is available in Shotgun. And our artists actually love this because since uh, editor editor is not really running dailies anymore, and we are just mm -hmm. running our own dailies, so it get, it opens opens up an opportunity that if we have to show anything or talk about anything like. Uh, uh, sur about surrounding shots or any reference materials, we can always Google and just talk about it. And it's easy for artists to understand. And uh, yeah, it's- That's uh, interesting. So your, your decisions are being made uh, on the fly and you can actually act on them uh, yeah, at yeah. that time, which is so a whereas, different, different like if, approach. Yeah, if we, are, if we are doing dailies at the studio, then uh, you know, uh, we are sort of handcuffed and uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, like whoever is running the dailies, they're just running the shot. And we don't have access to really show what we need to, uh, or at least not quickly, so in, not in very instantly. So that's uh, uh, yeah, that's something which uh, we really like. And uh, uh, I, I think that you know uh, nothing has changed in terms of like working at the office or remotely working. So I I think that the future of working is more toward leaning towards uh, remote working. I think. I'm sure a lot of people will be happy with that. For yeah. sure. Yeah, uh, you mentioned something earlier before we started this about uh, color management because that's actually quite a big uh, thing when you're working remotely. You don't have access to the same hardware. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you are doing there, Yash, to help the help that out? Yeah. So uh, you know, basically, one thing. I mean, luckily, I just live uh, five minutes away from from the office. So although like I'm not really allowed, I just by myself. I just go and do the tech checks. You know, whenever whenever I get some time, once in a while. Uh, so that at least somebody is looking at it in real life before we send it to client. So which yeah. is, uh, you know, uh, it is not uh, companies asking me to do it. It's just my self-interest that I'm doing it. No, that, that's dedication <laughs> and love for the craft. Uh, I like that. I also like that you guys do the screen recordings, almost building up a library of things, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how about you, Eric? How's it going over there? Yeah, we've had a very similar experience. Uh, we're using Teradici, which is a PCO, PCOIP technology. Um, and yeah, like uh, just echo what Brandon said, I was amazed by how quickly our system team were able to get uh, our entire staff, 250 artists, you know, moved to a work from home scenario in an incredible, you know, so fast, just over a period of a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, it was really impressive. And, you know, there was a lot of questions early on about, um, you know, how, how things were going to work, how are, how are we going to do dailies, how are we going to do quality control? Um, but, you know, those were answered pretty quickly, you know, with this technology. And uh, I think the thing that changed the most for us is really just how we communicate and how we collaborate with one another. Mm -hmm. You can't just walk over to someone's desk anymore. You can't overhear a conversation, you know, across the way and jump in with some information. So, uh, you know, communications become a lot more compartmentalized and there's these small little sessions of one-on-one -on -one sessions with artists or, you know, group meetings through uh, Gchat or whatever, uh, Google Meet. Uh, so that's really the big thing that's changed for us. In terms of our pipeline, we didn't really change all that much in how we work. Uh, it's more about how we collaborate and communicate. That's very interesting. And I love that the, everyone has uh, different contrasting um, ways of working and it really shows the range of how people have adapted, which is quite nice. So uh, let's move on to uh, talking about number of shots. Now, you know, episodic is a completely different beast than film. Uh, and it's just two different worlds. So now you're out of the studio, you're working from home. And it goes beyond just from working from home. But generally, and Brendan, I'll ask you this first, is typically how many shots uh, are we working on per episode? And it could be from any project. 
Uh, yeah, I think I think it really really vary, uh, varies for the for the size of the project and the award. Um, um, at least for me, in the last year, we we were in the middle of working on Lovecraft Country at Rodeo, uh, and uh, the, our, we were roughly about twelve hundred shots for that for that particular project across the whole good amount of shots. Yeah. yeah, it was it was it was one of our largest projects, and uh, you know, of course, during work from home and COVID, it was a it was it was a good challenge. So. Um, our, I think our biggest, uh, our biggest number of shots on that episode was about 380. Uh, and we were, yeah, just, it really depends on the, you know, uh, on the episode. So I can, I mean, some from 20 to 300. Episodes. And uh, how about yourself, Yash, what are you guys, you know, from the episodic, well, we know the turnaround deadlines are much tighter. Uh, we have to produce content at a, a, a different rate. Uh, how, how, are, how many shots are you guys usually uh, I think it's the uh, same thing again. <laughs> it's, uh, it totally depends on the show or the client or timeline or even scope of work. We have worked on a show which, which had like 2,600 shots to uh, just a few. It, it really depends. <laughs> and how about yourself, Joe? Yeah, so I have no idea how much <laughs> per show but, uh, or per episode, but I asked at work, like, how many do we do in a year? And they said in 2017, we did around 2000, 2018, we did 3,445, 2019, we did 2,285. And last year we did 1,100. Yeah. Uh, so it really depends on how many shows we have going on and the scope of the show. And some shows are crazy. And as some of these are really short, like, you know, like cosmetic fixes. And then some of them are like real big kind of, you know, big shots for us so it can really wildly vary on the show yeah definitely you know a bit of an open-ended question because obviously there's a lot of variables that go into that but i imagine mm -hmm. the trend uh, as we see moving forward uh, just keeps uh, increasing which is a good thing uh how about you eric yeah it's kind of the same it really it really um varies from episode to episode from show to show but you know one one trend i've sort of noticed is that Often the first episode and the last episode will be really big, and then you might have some smaller episodes in the middle. Um, everyone yeah, wants that's to interesting. lead off yeah, with you... a bang and then finish off with, you know, with a, finish off strong. So typically, that's you know, if I could identify one sort of pattern, then that would be it. You know, that especially that last episode, everyone wants to finish off strong, and those ones tend to be much bigger than the rest of the seasons usually. No, that's a great point. You want to draw people in, and then at the end, you want keep them wanting more so yeah you throw, right. throw the kitchen sink at the beginning and the end uh, that sounds about right um so next topic is uh, about new technology there is quite a few different technologies from machine learning to real-time solutions just wondering how each studio is uh, adopting or if they're adopting to those new technologies and even beyond uh, just that like maybe it's usd uh different color workflows so yash how about you guys uh, we are actually now we are moving to uh, uh, ACES, color, color, ACES color and uh, but in terms of episodic work, uh, basically episodic work need to be really faster and more affordable without compromising any quality. So the studios focus, uh, our studios uh, is exclusively focusing the, on that. Uh, so we have to like experiment with new technology. That's why uh, a few years ago we made a decision to switch to GPU rendering. Mm -hmm. and uh, for any 3D, 3D rendering needs. So the, obviously by now, uh, uh, you know, of course, a lot, lot of people are already doing that. So, uh, but we are definitely, uh, uh, you know, we started uh, using it like three years ago, pretty much, right? So other than that, we use game engines where it's uh, really needed. And uh, we are also using machine learning very extensively these days. And uh, Mars have invested a lot on uh, machine learning technology. And I, I definitely think that's, uh, you know, machine learning is uh, uh, definitely the future. Since our pipeline is fairly new, it was very easy for us to uh, embed machine learning tools and, you know, uh, uh, already in, into the pipe. And, uh, you know, I can't, I can't really share much about machine learning tools yet. No, you made it so, <laughs> I, so I curious now. Yeah. <laughs> But those, yeah, that's definitely some great technologies. And a lot of times, you know, it might be uh, Asus and sure there's studios that have been using Asus for a while now, but it is tough just to switch over completely different workflows. And it takes time in studios, especially when you have something that is running smoothly. Um, how about you, Brandon? How, how any new technologies uh, being introduced? 
Uh, yeah, a few things we're, we're, we're working on actively on. I mean, we're kind of the same thing. Uh, we, we revised our OCIO pipeline uh, as well uh, this last year, which has been a big helpful uh, help for us as well, color workflow. Um, uh, as far as machine learning, yeah, we're, we're actively, we're, we've been getting a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, requests for, you know, deep, deep fake kind of, uh, s s situations or solutions. So, uh, we've been working on kind of a deep fake act, you know, pipeline of how to, how, how do we, how do we implement that and, you know, training, you know, uh, machine learning of, of trying to refine and get better solutions. So that's been a, that's been a lot of fun. We have a few guys really actively working on how. All the best ways to go about that, right? Uh, and, and what, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask a follow up on there. Do you find that because there's uh, some misconceptions, and I think people uh, think that, oh my gosh, we're not going to be needed anymore. Uh, machines are going to take our jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you get that vibe from uh, artists? Uh, no, I don't think so yet. You know, I don't think we're, I think we're, you know, maybe it's coming in the future someday. And, but, you know, I think it, it takes, at least right now, even with the deep fake stuff, it really takes a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of input, um, you know, from, from us in terms of, you know, what we're, what kind of content we're feeding it. You know, for example, we are, you know, really kind of working through some, some scenarios right now. Of, okay. Like if we have, you know, if you want to, if you want to recreate, you know, a character smiling um, or recreate the lighting uh, scenarios of that, you know, you need to feed it the content uh, with, with a similar lighting scenario, you know, on the face, or if you want it to smile, you need to input it with, uh, you know, material and, and so forth. So, yeah, I and mean, that's a good point. I think there, there is worry, but I, I you know, I, you know, especially on our industry and, and on compositing side, uh, you need to have an artist still, you need that supervised, you um, training to happen uh we always need a defined outcome because it's a very specific look that we're getting you don't want to let the machine sort of figure out and, and think think things on its own on how what the worry is is if we have uh, ai doing the machine learning so you have robots yeah. doing our job then then it becomes a problem um how about you joe over take five you guys have adapted any type of technology or workflows that maybe you know should have done a little while ago doing now that type of thing yeah we no nothing we're we're <laughs> we're <laughs> we use uh we use vanilla nuke you know for the most part uh and so whatever is in nuke is is pretty much what we use that's the 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 bread and butter of you know whatever is in there um lately not lately i mean the last or the, maybe the last few years we've been using uh keen tools mm -hmm, that's like great. a really nice that's a really nice plugin for uh facial tracking especially the deforming faces. So that's something that's really nice that, you know, you can't, which you, you can do that in other, you know, 3D tracking software, but it's hard. Like it takes a while to get the really nice deforming faces. And this is so easy. The, the thing that I think where it stands out is just really nice and it's just so easy to use. So, um, so that's something that we've added uh, that was kind of nice. There was also, I think, it was early this year or late last year, uh, some compositor, I, I'm sorry, I forget his name. He put together like this compositing toolkit or like a survival toolkit or something like that. I think- I recall this, yes. Yeah, yeah, I forget the name of I, I the website, but it was like a really nice collection of a lot of gizmos that, uh, including some from Spin, that, uh, you know, he packaged up really nicely with nice documentation explaining it all. So that's really nice too. But as, as far as like cutting edge machine learning or anything like that, no, no, we don't, we haven't dipped our toe into that yet. No, hopefully, tools, hopefully soon though. Hopefully soon. And the keen tools are a fantastic set of tools and they, they work beautifully in Nuke, which is quite nice. And speaking of those spin tools, definitely something you use all the time in compositing. Love that chromatic uh, gizmo. Uh, so uh, <laughs> Eric, pass it off to you. It's nice to hear that other people are using our tools. That's great. Um, for us, I mean, we put in a lot of work you know, sort of in the back end in USD. And it's really going to change the way that we work and share data at the studio. Um, you know, things are changing. It's not, uh, it's not like a linear workflow like it once was, where things cascade from department to department. You know, USD is going to allow us to collaborate in different ways and to share 3D data. You know, it changes how we package things and how we edit things. And, uh, so we've done a lot of work to prepare for that. We haven't deployed it yet on the floor, but that is something that we're definitely working hard in the background uh, to, to get ready. 
Yeah, USD is definitely one of those um, industry trends that will change the way we work. And uh, at some point, uh, every studio will be uh, using it. So it, definitely two points of view. And the studios that are fully adopted or the studios that are doing investigation and the studios that are, are mid-implementation of it. So for sure, uh, at some point, we're going to see that be the everyday, the norm for every day. Um, so let's talk a bit about some of the projects again, can be as specific as you want to be, uh, but is there any re recent shots or sequences you're extremely proud of? And this could be because of a technical achievement, it doesn't have to be something so visual, but maybe you can uh, explain why. Uh, Yash, let's start with you. Uh, there are a lot of uh, sequences on Marvel WandaVision that uh, we are really proud of, but uh, of course we can't discuss that <laughs> yet. But, uh, uh, you know, so I would say uh, the second season of Umbrella Academy, where we were responsible for Wanya and uh, Arlan's powers. So their powers are like force fields of white, blue, and yellow light, and they were purely uh, done in compositing uh, in just Nuke. And, oh, nice. Uh, the major effect uh, is in last three episodes, and we did that uh, using like new 3D, uh, 3D, 3D space, uh, which allowed us to make sure the wall of light in this effect, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't look flat. And uh, it was very important for us to show real power and uh, thickness and intensity of the effect, even though it was done in 2D. Uh, so we did, we did, we did that with uh, you know pretty, uh, uh, pretty old displacement, distortion, and camera shake and uh, you know flickering. Uh, just to sell the effect and yeah it ended up looking good those are two great shows i'll have to go back and watch uh umbrella academy again and keep an eye out for them like <laughs> love that it's all, all done in nuke that's pretty awesome uh how about you eric yeah i have to see you know it, it's hard it's like picking your favorite child but <laughs> there's uh, always one <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, since we're talking about Umbrella Academy, I mean, uh, at Spin, we did the season two opener, which was that two minute long shot. Uh, and for us, you know, we were really proud of that just because of the sheer complexity and volume of, of that. I mean, it was a, a complete 360 degree blue screen stage, you know, with shipping containers. And we had to do a, a full digital environment that you could see from any direction. And then we had, you know, there were digital doubles, there were CG buildings in there, there was, you know, fire and smoke and muzzle flashes and blood spatter. And we had all of our heroes, of course, sort of at the height of their powers, you know, Klaus is summoning, you know, an army of dead soldiers and, you know, Al's, Al's blown, heads blowing up and it was just crazy. And, uh, and the sheer volume, I think there was almost 3,000 frames in that sequence. It ran for two minutes, wow. one long shot. And so the complexity of just putting that all together and the logistics of figuring out how we're going to execute that and how we move from plate to plate, uh, because the, the photography was filmed over a period of, you know, over a week. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't a one in the sense that it was one long take traditionally, but we had to combine uh, multiple takes seamlessly to make it appear as though it was filmed in, in one go. Uh, I recall Extremely complex, yeah. and, but we're very, very proud of the result. It's a beautiful shot. So I wonder on a shot like that, do you have a one compositor comping the whole shot or is it compositors working on separate sections that you piece together in the end or how does that work? Yeah, we had a huge team of people working on that um, and we had to divide it up into a whole bunch of little sections because you know, it's just impossible to work on one shot that's two minutes long all at once. So we had to break it up into little bite-sized pieces. Um, we even ingested it that way so that we weren't really working in one shot. It was really, it was almost like 10 or 11 shots. And then in the end, we would combine that all in one. But yeah, we had, you know, we just had so many prep artists because it was all blue screen. We had to key the whole thing. There were tracking right. markers everywhere. There was lots of paint work and, and seams to correct and things like that. And then just a huge amount of CG uh, C CG characters and effects integration that we had to do. So we had a we had a large team of people working on that shot. That's excellent. It is a gorgeous shot. Um, and you. Brendan, how about you? Yeah, we had a kind of a little bit of a sort of similar shot like that where we had a uh, on the on Lovecraft Country um, on one of our episodes where we had a quite a quite a, an amazing transformation of a character to do from a, a mummy into a, a living breathing. Uh, real life actress again and as the camera is kind of doing a full 360 degree move um, there's about five different plates that we needed to kind of reconcile into um, you know into one smooth move 
um, as well as kind of trying to, you know, achieve and, and, and fix parallax issues and trying to, you know, make, make everything work together and match um, the, the existing plate that we wanted to use. So there's a lot of that similar re reconstruction and nuke and reprojection of, you know, you know, everything in the set basically needed to be rebuilt, uh, repositioned inside the frame and then we can um, make that work. Um, that, that, one, that one was one of the most outstanding shots I think that, that we did on the project. That was just like, wow, after, you know, seeing what we what we needed to, what we had to, to, to build the shot and then the final product was, uh, was pretty impressive. And yeah. a, lot of, a lot of smart vectors as well. That was oh, great. A, Huge, 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 one of the my favorite tools, at least in Nuke, to um, definitely aid us in a, in a lot of a lot of extra uh, body match move work as well as projection. Yeah, those long shots are, are are so lovely and just really get you into the story and tell a uh, tell you a piece of the story in this nice way. I still call them Scorsese shots um, when I see them. It's just my personal opinion. And then uh, Joe, uh, on to you. Yeah, I mean, it, to be honest, it, it's more of like a, a person that I was really, really proud of. We had this show for Netflix called Lock and Key. And part of the show, um, the characters, they have these jars that store memories. And they're supposed to be like these kind of like a glowing sort of magical effect. And there was one guy at our studio, Jerry, who just put the whole look together. And uh, he made such a beautiful comp that it's the type of comp that, you know, you open it up and it's like, oh, like it's just pretty to look at, you know? And then not only pretty to look at, but it was like everything was so well organized and really well thought out and structured in such a, a, a nice way that when he gave it out to the other artists, it was like a pleasure to work on, you know? Uh, and the, the shots were fine, like the shots turned out and everybody like, you know, but I was really just proud of the amount of work that he put into it and, and it, the way, you know, he really made that effect and everyone else was just kind of going off of his, his work. So that was really, that was really cool to see. He was more of like a, I was there when he was hired and he was more like a junior artist mm -hmm. and to see his progression and for him to do that was, uh, was really, really cool. I love to hear, I love that he had input on it and what he did and, and what he came up with became the final effect for it. That's something you can definitely yeah, yeah. Be, be proud of. That's very cool. For sure. Um, so, you know, uh, we have a little bit more time. So I'm just going to ask uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first thing is, you know, virtual production has come up more and more and more. I'm just wondering if uh, if it's gone into your studios or you have clients requesting it. Uh, if it's becoming uh, the main trend moving forward, I would say. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Yash, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, so we definitely have uh, a lot of requests on the, uh, the, the end, but uh, I don't think uh, as a company, uh, Mars is really interested in moving uh, in that direction. Yeah. That's fair, fair enough. That's clear and concise. Uh, Brandon, how about yourself? Yeah, we are we're definitely actively exploring that. Um, we had actually one of our, uh, um, our CG soups uh, went uh, with, uh, oh, excuse me, was it? Uh, uh, I forget the name of the engine now. Uh, it, what? Um, Unreal. Unreal. Oh, Unreal. Yeah. yeah. So they were invited into the uh, the Unreal Fellowship, uh, mm -hmm. kind of you know ex explore some of what are the options. So we have a live action studio um, that that we do a lot of uh, you know, filming elements and so forth. So we're definitely experimenting with that. Um, some virtual reality, uh, you know, three uh, D tracking capabilities, just so we can. You know, some of the stuff that we saw in The Mandalorian was just like, wow, you know, and some of the behind the scenes, you know, magic that we're doing. So we're definitely actively uh, exploring that and trying to figure out how best we can implement that. We're doing, um, we're, we're using that for previs as well on um, Unreal Engine. Um, that's, you know, some of the results. Unreal 5 isn't out yet. So looking forward to to getting our hands on that and how we can, you know, best implement that. Cause we're already, even some of the stuff that we're doing for previous, like, you know, for background elements, you know, you're, you're, you really can save a lot of time and money. And, and especially with the episodic content that we have now, it's, you know, it's really, how do you get the shots out quickly and efficiently and, you know, staying on budget. So some of these, some of these tools can be really effective. Absolutely. Uh, how about over at spin? Yeah, we're definitely involved. Uh, you know, we've already done a few productions using virtual production technology. 
Uh, you know, it's it's something that's coming. It's coming big, and we have to prepare for it. And it's going to change a lot of things. I mean, a lot of the conversation around virtual production, and we kind of touched upon this earlier, is you know, is it going to threaten our livelihoods or our jobs? And uh, especially when it comes to green screens, because traditionally, you know, especially for compositing, those green screen or blue screen sequences are kind of the you know bread and butter. Um, you know, there's long sequences. You get a lot of shots like that. Um, but you know, compositors do a lot more than green screens. And in my opinion, as long as you know we're digitally manipulating images, uh, you'll have a need for compositors. And and I think virtual production and those technologies are going to bring their own new set of challenges and, and things that we're going to have to fix and adjust. Uh, you know, seams along the bottom of the stage. You know, maybe more a pat patterns and stuff that you're seeing. Uh, you know, you run into issues with using proxy renders on those screens and maybe the resolution's not quite, you know, where you need it to be. So you, you might find you have to replace some of that uh, footage in post anyway. Um, so there's a number of new challenges that are going to evolve, I think, as a result of this new technology. And, um, you know, I don't think uh, our jobs are going away anytime soon. And the demand for content is, is greater than it's ever been, you know, with all the streaming services. And uh, in terms of the timeline, I mean, the big, the big thing that I've noticed in television uh, over the past several years is just the expectations in terms of quality have just skyrocketed. There's just really no room, you know. When I f first started working in television, you know, we used to say, you know, this is good enough for TV, and that just doesn't exist anymore. Like we're <laughs> we're delivering, you know, feature films on, you know, in a in a couple of weeks, you know, every every two weeks we're delivering a small feature film, basically. And, and the expectation in terms of quality is right on par, if not even more so in some cases. Um, and then and just in the fact that there's these increasing resolutions, you know, 4K and 6K and 8K, um, it's a real challenge to deal with that volume of data and to maintain that, you know, that detail and precision in, in all the work that you do. That's one of the, the big challenges for us. Yeah, I would, I would imagine so. I would imagine with virtual production, also color cast might be an issue at times. Maybe it's not exactly how it should look. So it will require a lot of um, the compositors assistance on that. But maybe uh, compositors would be happy about not having to comp in reflections uh, anymore. It might be a nice thing. Absolutely. Um, I don't miss those blue screen sequences. Sometimes they can, you know, they can be difficult and challenging. And, and sometimes they don't always look as good as you want them to. Um, so I certainly won't miss that kind of stuff. <laughs> For sure. So another, uh, you know, emerging technology or not even emerging at this point, but something to definitely be aware of and, and be honed in on uh, for all compositors, whether you're doing it or not, something to get, uh, keep a good understanding on for sure. Uh, how about you, Joe? Yeah, I mean, honestly, that, that kind of work doesn't filter down. I know productions that Take 5 is doing is are using like virtual production, but that doesn't filter down to us on the, in the in-house team. Uh, but I am curious, like I, it is something that I'm looking at or even not like not virtual production, but using game engines or just like fast rendering, basically, you know, if, if I need to put trees in the background of something, could I bring in, you know, something from speed tree, throw it into unreal track a camera, bring in the FBX and then get it out that way. You know, like, um, that's something that I'm kind of looking at or, or trying to see if, if I can incorporate you know, that into my work. So that's something that I've been looking at. But then on the other hand, honestly, I find Unreal really, it's, it's, I've been playing around with it. I find it tough to work in. I don't find it the most, uh, the, the nicest program compared to other things that I've used. So I, what I'm hoping for, I'm hoping that the other kind of renderers kind of step up and kind of meet the challenge of online render, or, you know, of real-time rendering mm -hmm. so that, you know, maybe like Redshift, like I know Redshift is working on Redshift RT, like right. Redshift real time. So, you know, do we have to all learn new software? Do I have to learn Unreal? Or could it be that ho I'm hoping that some of the renderers kind of, you know, really leverage the new video cards and that technology so that we get faster rendering without having to kind of relearn the wheel and, and not have to kind of you know, again, it's unreal and do all that stuff, but is there not like a, a faster renderer that we can use and get some of the similar results from it? Yeah, you're right. And, and a lot of these, uh, you know, if we were to look into the future, really this is in the hands of the manufacturer of the graphics card. So we'll, we'll <laughs> find out how that goes uh, yeah. along. 
Okay, and last question before we move on to Q&A, and this is just a, a light one because of all of who you are. How uh, messy are your compositors' comps? Do you ever have to get really tough with them, or do they usually try and keep it neat? Uh, Brendan, let's start with you. Uh, again, I think that, uh, that varies uh, from artist to artist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think generally people try to keep a fairly clean workflow. Um, I really try hard not to um, shuffle people's comps around, but um, you know that's really something that we, we, we do talk about in terms of you know workflow and trying to keep it clean for you know if we need to shuffle a shot, that, you know last minute somebody stick her out, but. Uh, definitely open some some pretty crazy scripts for sure. Yeah, I would imagine some of you opening and you're just trying to figure out where yeah. do I even start with this one, right? And Joe, how about you? I know you're a very clean compositor. I'm the worst. I am the worst <laughs> human alive when it comes to keeping my comps clean. I am the person that you don't like. I feel bad when some, sometimes you know you're in the middle of production, like oh Joe, we got to take that shot and give it to someone. I'm like no, no, wait, wait, let me let me clean this up a little bit first. <laughs> Because it's embarrassing when other people open up my shots because they'll look at it and they'll be like, what, what are you doing? So I, I try, I try to keep it, uh, you know, maybe when it's rendering, I'll try to tidy things up and, but I'm, I'm really bad for that. Like you can tell when, you know, when, when, when has Joe been working on the shot when he first got it? And then when has Joe been working on the shot when it's due? Because it's sort of like, you'll see nice clean stuff at the top and then as it gets to the bottom, yeah, it's like a, it's a spider web. <laughs> Uh, yeah. so I'm, I'm the, the worst, the worst alive when it comes to that. You know, I think it is also have to do a bit, a bit, uh, with, uh, episodic, right. You got to run and gun a bit more. You got to get things done. So you're just, I'm just, so, I'm, I'm, I'm a horrible out. person. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Yash? How's the team over at Mars? Yeah. So our team generally, uh, you know, they try their best to keep it clean and, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely it looks, uh, cleaner in the beginning, like maybe first for first few versions of the shot, then uh, you know starts to become a spider web, almost at the you know version 45 or something, you know. So uh, we try to keep uh, uh, the shots with the same artist, so we don't really have any issues with the other artists complaining about the previous script. So uh, yeah, so we we avoid uh, shuffling shots. So just. Uh, I think every every compositor is relieved to hear that it's not just them; it's pretty much everyone doing that. How about yeah. uh, Eric? Yeah, you know, sometimes the comp gets away from you and things get a little messy, but you know, for <laughs> the most part, we've got a we've got a great team at Spin, and uh, we put a lot of effort into best practices and training. Um, and so, when anytime anyone joins the company, you know, we we kind of show them exactly how we want things laid out, you know. And for the most part, people are really good at respecting that. Um, and so you can really open up a script from any artist and the way that the things are laid out, uh, it's going to be pretty consistent. Um, so it's pretty easy to jump into someone else's work if you have to. Um, but yeah, of course, there's times where, you know, especially when you're doing like look dev and things like that. And, um, you know, you're, you're just being creative. Uh, and you're not worried too much about being tidy. Uh, and then usually, you know, before we roll that out to the team, we'll go back and clean things up and group things and template things. Um, to prevent things from getting out of control. We would spend a lot of time over the past year just really focusing on efficiencies in, in our workflows. Um, just to, like, uh, like managing bounding boxes, that sort of thing? Just in everything that we do, we, we focused a lot in our production processes and our procedures, um, efficiencies within our comp, you know, trying to trying to be really efficient with how we deal with, yeah, with things like bounty boxes and, and resolutions and using proxies when it's, when it's smart and pre-comping, you know, sections of the scripts and, and things like that. Just trying to compartmentalize things um, so that we can, you know, be agile and, and move quickly. You know, so we spent a lot of time over the past year looking at those types of things, uh, you know, looking at things, not only things that we need to improve, but we know we, we identify things that we do really well and then how can we build on those things? Um, so, but yeah, there's always there's always one script that's gonna that's gonna explode and you just you know. <laughs> bounding boxes and concatenation. Everyone, just make sure you're keeping an eye on those things for sure. But there really is sure. two kinds of um, you know, say messy compositors. Is you have this really huge wide script where you're scrolling and scrolling to find pieces, or you know maybe it's at the look dev portion where everything's really close together. Those nodes as you begin to work thing out. And then you got to stretch them out uh, later on. Um, 
All right. So I think we are, as we run close to the time limit here, let's go ahead and look into the Q and a portion. Um, so let's jump in. Jesse had a question here, which is how much of your transition work from home or live at work involved, uh, carting hardware to homes, uh, hatch Co corporation sent design techs home with full stations and display. So I think it's the, the hardware challenge are the studios providing, or are you lucky enough that you have a monster workstation at home and you'd rather use that? So maybe Yash, we'll start with you. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, yeah, since we are remote, uh, remoting into uh, our machines at the office, at the studio, so we don't really need an expensive machine at all. And uh, so for artists who were working with us before, uh, I mean, pre-COVID, for them, we actually, uh, you know, lended them monitors or Wacom uh, tablets or even, uh, you know, LAN cables because it's also TPN uh, a request that you know we cannot use Wi-Fi in order to connect our machines, so we need LAN cables. So uh, we provided those kind of things because nobody had like thirty feet cable, <laughs> right. something like that, right? So yeah, we ordered them in bulk and we provided those kind of things, uh, basic stuff for people on who are working with us. But uh, uh, although Mars grew, uh, uh, we doubled the size uh, during pandemic. So for artists who are working from across the globe, really, uh, like half of our team is all over the place. They're right. not from Toronto. And for uh, those artists, we are not really providing anything uh, in terms of uh, hardware. So as long as they have even like basic computer, like let's say laptop, but uh, with the good two monitors, so they're, they're, they're set uh, because they're remote, remoting into our machine. They're not using uh, their machine to render or we're not sending any files or vice versa. So uh, yeah, that helps. Oh, definitely. And I think, Brendan, you hinted at, um, you know, Wacom tablets and trying to get some hardware across. But um, anything else that, you know, needed to be uh, brought over? No, uh, yeah, really similar to, uh, to Yash. Uh, yeah, we, su uh, we supplied the monitors and, um, you know, in some cases, uh, even, even laptops, if, if uh, you know, artists didn't have that to the capability to work. But we're Kind of same solution we're, we're really jobbing into uh, the physical machine at work so yeah wacom tablets um you know any 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 simple hardware that that artist needed was, was supplied if needed i would imagine similar experience uh for the rest i'm gonna head to tony's question i like this question so how reliant are you guys using comp templates you know treat this as two things uh, and or slash live groups to try and keep things consistent or is it just not that kind of repeatability because of the type of work. Uh, so maybe Eric, uh, you know, we, we talk about the compositors and you're, you're, you know, as they first come in, you show them the way we like to work, um, but how, or, or how much of it is driven it by templates for different sort of shot situations or are they laying down nodes as they start each shot? Yeah, we actually use templates quite a lot. Um, not necessarily across entire uh, projects, but, you know, for specific, looks or for specific effects or you know, maybe it's a character um when we're doing that look dev i mentioned it earlier you know things are messy at first when you're coming up with the look and you're putting things together but then you know we try as best we can to to template that out group it out uh, add controls and things like that so it's um so that we can achieve a similar look across a sequence uh, from a, a wide range of artists um so yeah we we don't really use live groups though at all um uh, found with live groups, although, you know, I, I, I really want to use them, but I think from a logistics point of view on, in a large studio, uh, it presents a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, how you version those things, um, how you assign those, those live group tasks out independently in a shot in terms of um, how it's tasked out in shotgun and scheduled and things like that. Um, how you tracking the progression of the live groups independently from the main script. So there's a lot of little nuances and things like that on the logistics side that make, uh, at least for us, live groups a challenge to, to integrate into our pipeline. But uh, certainly templates is something that we do uh, quite a lot. Makes sense. And Joe, how about you? Yeah, almost the same thing. If there's a look that has been established, templates for sure that an artist will kind of develop a, a master look for things and then uh you know that'll go out to the other artists um 
so yeah, and live groups, I don't think we've ever used live groups. Um, templates are just, fat, like, they, they seem to be faster. There's, there's not very much setup for it. Um, and then other shot, but that's all, it's only for shots where there would be a specific look that's been established for an element or something that has to be passed on to everybody. So it's not something like a library where in the sense of, okay, I'm, I'm keying, so let's plot this no, template. No. Um, okay, gotcha. No, not, no, not like that. And how about Brandon? Yeah, yeah, very similar. Um, uh, I use a lot of templates, you know, like if it's a specific sequence, um, like it too, for example, we had, we had a very specific lighting setup uh, for a lot of the shots that were very similar. So just to keep everything, because we need, you know, a lot of shots from, from, from shot to shot were really the same environment. So we try to keep it not, not strict by any means, but just keeping everybody kind of on the same page and, and just the way that things were driven and how we're controlling light groups and, and uh, those kind of scenarios, which came out of lighting with a, with a template for the artist that was really the bare bones of kind of how to assemble the shot. So I right. that's really helpful in those situations. And over at Mars, is templates the king? Everyone starts with the template or? Definitely. So uh, we at least try to use a basic template for everything. And uh, the, the reason is just to avoid messy script, right? Even, uh, even if they're creatively, uh, uh, if the shots are creatively different, uh, at least the basic structure of the script is similar. Uh, it's easy for everybody to navigate it. So uh, we do, uh, we definitely, we are interested in training artists and, you know, uh, uh, and uh, we encourage artists to use templates. Yeah, that's uh, that's good to hear. So, Tony, it sounds like there is a sort of mixed on there, but definitely if there's a specific look, it's template driven. But as uh, the general, um, it's not always the case. So uh, one quick question. We do have to wrap up soon. So I'll just ask uh, one person here. So Tony's asking, as for uh, at home productivity, have you found that have you found ways to get teams to retain that speed of working? that they had when they're working together in person. Uh, Eric, I'll ask you. You know what, I think actually our productivity has increased. We were worried at the beginning of this that you know it would we'd, we'd suffer, but I think the fact that you're home and that you can, you know, you can still conduct your day-to-day, -day, you know, and, and get work done and you can work at different times of the day you know, I love the fact that if a shot's coming in late at night, I don't have to be at the studio late waiting for a shot to come in. I can just, I can carry about my business during the day and then I can log in and check that shot later in the evening. You know, there's a lot of conveniences like that. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's true for a lot of our artists. So, um, and another big thing is, you know, we're, we're not commuting to work. I mean, that's a huge thing for myself. You know, it's, I'm an, an hour, sometimes, you know, an hour and a half, depending on traffic away from the office though. So, you know, that's like 15 hours a week that I'm not commuting anymore, that I'm now productive because I can be working during that time. So, and I think, you know, you know, things like that, you know, people can do the laundry during the day or they can, you know, and, and still get work done. So I think, you know, in terms of that quality of life uh, and work-life balance, uh, and for a lot of people, they really, really enjoy working from home. That's, uh, and judging by all the shaking heads, I think everyone agrees with you on that, but that's a great point. And I think uh, uh, the work uh, home life balance has definitely uh, improved because of that, especially with that commute that so many people have to uh, endure. So I'm going to go ahead and thank absolutely everybody. You guys have been uh, awesome and really some fantastic information uh, being shared here. So let me just share my screen one more time as we wrap this up here. So big, big thanks to all you guys. Thank you so much. I know you guys are super busy uh, rolling in the middle of production constantly and taking the time out to spend uh, here at Spark. And thank you from Foundry. So uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and attending today's session. Uh, if you do want to learn more about Nuke, uh, Foundry has an upcoming webinar empowering artists with Nuke 13, which is right around the corner, and that's on March 16th. Uh, we're also hosting a webinar to launch color management, a color management training series by uh, Victor Perez and uh, also from Netflix, and that is on March 31st. So keep connected with Foundry. Uh, you can visit our event page at foundry.com forward slash events for more information. So some exciting things coming up. So again, uh, I'll 
will never say this too much. Thank you guys for joining in and sharing your information, your experience. We just have such a load of experience between all of you and coming in at it from different angles. So it's been a great panel. So thank you everybody for watching and thank you to our panelists.